My name is Don McCoy. Uh, my family came here in the 50s and uh, grew up here in the Rogue Valley. And we never had forest fires like this. Never saw this kind of thing. And when we did have a forest fire, we put the damn thing out. And we got in there and did it. And we logged the forest. We took care of the forest. We had timber. My dad built houses here out of the local timber. And we had a good life. Then I watched the whole forest uh, creep disintegrate under the spotted owl. And now I'm watching it get burned up, you know, and there's no place for the spotted owl to go. So I'm just, there, I've been to all these different meetings and I've watched and listened to everybody I'm trying to pay a lot of attention to what's going on here. And we're losing our resources, we're losing our health, we're losing our economy. I mean, I've been in real estate 18 years and I've talked to dozens and dozens and dozens of realtors. I just speak to a lot of them. We are sick and tired of this. It is really ridiculous how far things have gone. And I've lost, um, just this last summer, in excess of $2 million in sales for my family. People came here, they said, what's the smoke about? And I'm, I said, well, every summer, you know, we've got this burning going on. <clears throat> and, uh, they went away and never came back. People would fly in here in their planes four hours later, they booked a flight and got right out of here. I mean, story after story after story of losing really interesting, intelligent people moving to our community. And they're smart enough to know that they're not going to breathe this air. You know, the, the toxic fumes that that puts off, it's long-lasting. It's effective on health. And I know it has everybody else, whether they admit it or not. But you breathe this stuff for as long as you do, it's got, and I don't smoke. I don't smoke cigarettes, but I turned into a smoker the last five years. <laughs> and it's not fun. And I've got, now I've got problems. I have a breathing problem. I start coughing. I, don't smoke. I never used to do that. So my final thing is, is we've got to get back to what's been said so many times here. It's just a normal... Forestry practices, let's put these doggone fires out, let's put some people back to work, get in there, let's use our resources instead of burning them up. It doesn't make any common sense. And this whole idea of the way it was done a hundred years ago or whatever by the Indians or whatever, when there were some pioneers here and stuff, there's people living here now. And a lot of us, there's a lot of people living here. And we've got to find another way to do it besides this idea of Let's just burn it all up, and oh, then somehow we've got a sustainable life ahead of us with no resources. I mean, none of this is really good common sense. And all this strategy and all these details and all these statistics ain't working. So I hope we get a handle on this thing and push back, stop the ridiculousness and the insanity. And thank you. Hi, I'm uh, uh, Jack Shipley. I'm a 46-year resident and small woodland owner in the Applegate. Uh, my upper 40 acres is uh, surrounded by BLM on all four sides, so it's an infolding within BLM lands. And uh, I'm also a board chair of the Applegate Partnership and Watershed Council and also the chair of the uh, Southwest Oregon Prescribed Fire Council. And uh, BLM, uh, about a decade ago, had between 10 and $12 million a year budgeted and allocated for hazardous fuel reduction. And uh, that lasted for almost a decade. And several years ago, those dollars started going down. And uh, I called the fire management officer at the Metro District BLM to find out where those dollars were going. And they said they were going for sage grouse recovery on the east side. And I said, well, what was the driver behind this? They said, they don't know. I need to call the Portland office. And so I called the state office in Portland and talked to the FMO up there. And they got the same answer. They didn't know. Uh, maybe I should call the Boise Fire Center. And I called the Boise Fire Center, and they didn't know. And ultimately, I got hold of an undersecretary of interior back in Washington, D.C. And found out that the... the the, those dollars that were allocated for the Medford District BLM for hazardous fuels were being reallocated to sage grouse recovery 
because of lobbying by the oil and gas industry. Because if, if the sage grouse got listed, they would lose access to 14 million acres of oil and gas leases on BLM lands. So our valley has been put at risk by the oil and gas industry, by their successful lobbying. And, uh, and I, I ask you as part of uh, uh, Jackson, as Jackson County Commissioners and part of the, uh, uh, the ONC uh, counties to demand that the Congress refund the hazardous fuel dollars allocated to metro districts so we can get back into the business of doing management on these lands that will help reduce the catastrophic, uh, catastrophic fire event. Thank you. Oh, I thank you for letting me speak. Um, my wife woke me up at 11 o'clock one night and said I can't breathe. She has asthma. And we had to literally drive out until we got to Corvallis and we went to Newport, Oregon, and then she moved to California. She moved from California to get away from the bad air, and she had to live there for eight weeks. She feels it is permanently damaged her lungs and wants to move. That would break my heart. My great 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 grandmother came from Missouri to Bend on a wagon train. You know, we're Oregon's pioneer family here, and it would kill me to leave Southern Oregon. So, anyway, I have two letters to submit one from Kathy and one from me, but I would like to say a few things. I, as I understand the problem, of course, many people have already said it, it's a lack of logging, lack of forest management by both the Forest Service and BLM, lack of thinning and controlled burns in the fall, winter, and spring. The Let It Burn policy of the Forest Service to allow it to burn in the summer is insane. One Forest Service employee named Tina Lanier, she could have put a fire out in one acre. There were two helicopters standing by. Her let it burn nutso policy allowed 197,000 acres and 14 houses to burn. Has any terrorist done more damage to Oregon than that here? I don't know of one. And that was a clear example where she could have put the fire out. I mean, Sal Esquivel said there were two state helicopters just ready to do it. In fact, they started to and she wouldn't let The last thing that she did before she got promoted was to say you could only salvage 4,000 of the 197,000 acres. How much money do you think that you could get into the Forest Service if they allowed 197,000 acres to be logged? They would have enough money from that one sale to manage all the restoration projects in the whole forest. The Forest Service has spent hundreds of millions of dollars removing culverts and roads, and now you can't get firefighters in. They want to keep people out of the woods. Even today, they're proposing to take out another new 120 acres of logging roads. When the tenant was here, you were required to build the logging roads, put in the culverts, and do it. And the firefighters, by the time they got there, a lot of the loggers had already put out the fires. That's right. The, uh, the Forest Service will not even allow heavy equipment to put out the fires into many regions in Southern Oregon. Um, the smoke was never considered an issue by the Forest Service. I heard the man say that in a public meeting. They never even thought about it. It's not in their policies. They don't care. Well, my wife is going to have to leave Oregon, and it breaks my heart. Our business has suffered greatly. Um, there's no longer people that want to come to Southern Oregon. In our home building business, there's many people now, when they come out to look, one of the realtors said that, they, you know, when they're here during the smoke, they just left. And many friends of mine in the community that you would know are now talking about leaving. I mean, there's hundreds of people that are not going to be able to live here if something isn't changed quickly. Um, there's one last thing that I wanted to say, is that there's this new thing that's going through Congress to extend the wild and scenic areas by 200,000 acres. Well, as part of those policies, and that's all the houses, all the way from where it is now, Gray Street Bridge, to the dam. Everybody that owns a house <coughs> along the river, you can't even prune an apple tree without getting approval from the Forest Service or the BLM. You can't thin your trees. You can't do anything to prevent forest fires. The, the Forest Service now, in the wild and scenic that they have, you have to get approval from the Secretary of Agriculture to prune an apple tree, for God's sakes. And so that's something that's not on the radar, but I really would think you should look into it because that isn't a wild and scenic area where there's thousands of houses. That's not what it was created for. 
and it's going to cause a huge burden on every citizen that lives in Jackson and Josephine County if they allow that to go through, and it's going to really help. It's going to really hurt putting out fires when you can't thin your own trees. Uh, but there is hope. The proposal, I recently met with Merv George, and he's the new forest supervisor. And his plan, I would think that you would adopt in two seconds. Number one, put out all fires during the fire season. Allow more logging, allow burning of underbrush, thin fuels in the forest. And we'll do this in the time of year where you're not going to burn everything down. Um, control burns, he's for all of that. But 100% suppression during the fire season. So, I mean, everything he said to me was exactly what I think everybody in this audience would love to see. So I think you're going to really have to support him. by the environmental groups. And he let, he let uh, cats go into the wilderness area to put out the fires. He did more putting out these fires than anybody knows or can give him credit for. If he wouldn't have done what he did, the fires would, until the rain, the fires would still be going. So anyway, thank you for letting me speak. My name is Teresa Holliday, and I own a small uh, holistic clinic in Medford, and I wanted to share some of what I've heard from our patients. Um, they are being told by their doctors to leave this area. They are being given prescriptions to basically move two, three hours away because of the air quality, because of their illnesses. This is a senior community. They have compromised lung capacity. They do not have the ability to overcome a lot of the illnesses if their lungs are compromised. I've spoken with uh, firefighters and those who uh, dispatch them and coordinate efforts. And all of them have told us that because the loggers are, no, are really no longer there, they are the first responders when it comes to fire. And if they're not there, that's why it grows so quickly and that's why we have to respond the way we do. Because there are no boots on the ground. Um, I moved here eight years ago because, because the area is beautiful. Because the people here are so nice. And sorry, I'm just like nervous. People here in my and uh, I see them moving away. I see the the demographics are changing, and um, I, I we moved here because of that. I would like to not move away. I think people here are absolutely wonderful. Um, if they move away, that will create a void for people who. I'll just say are coming over the border a little much and they might not be as nice about this topic when they're here. Um, I really would like to see the people here stay. I would like to contribute to the health of the people here um, by having the clean air, the clean water, and the beauty that we're known for here. And I would like to stay too. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. My name is Nikita Wilkinson. And I moved here for, uh, to Rogue Valley 32 years ago from Southern California. And one of the several reasons I moved here from Southern California was to get away from the smog. And the, the smoke here is far worse than I ever breathed in Orange County or Los Angeles County. The Rogue Valley has become a place that is just horrible to live during much of the year. We have a new fifth season. We can call it fire season. And it lasts up to five months with fires starting possibly in June and going all the way to October when the rains finally start. But just because the smoke finally with the rain at the end of October when it starts to rain, it takes a couple more months of coughing to rid your lungs of the particulates that have settled deep in your lungs. I am still dealing with this. I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. And I, I sound and I cough like a two-a-day, two-pack-a-day smoker. And it's really really discouraging to me. I coughed and had sore throats for months, even though I wore an N95 approved mask. I was not able to hike or bicycle or walk the dog or attend any concerts in the park or any movies in the park or swim in the lakes, the ponds, or the rivers, or fish. And I do this every summer before this horribleness started about 10 years ago. It has become a miserable existence to the residents that live here. I am wary of the powers that be blaming climate change. An example of this can be seen in the new National Climate Assessment that recently came out. The first chapter in the report lists recent natural disasters, 
saying this summer's deadly car fire in California was an example of climate change. The report glosses over the real reason fires have grown in intensity and size. The 30 years of increased environmental restrictions on logging and the increased environmental restrictions on brush clearance and preventative burns, and this has caused a massive and dangerous fuel buildup, a problem that was predicted years ago and has nothing to do with global warming. It's time that people speak out against this travesty of mismanagement of our forests that harms our lungs, our businesses, our hobbies, and our air. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, thanks for inviting me to say a few words and thanks very much for convening this event. It's really it's especially helpful for me as I leave for Salem for the session to be reminded of what the impact of this was just a few months ago. It's it's wet out there now and I can breathe and it's uh, it, this is a really important refresher. I heard a comment a few speakers ago about how there are really a lot of people out here and they really suffered this time. And uh, as you know, it's, it's up to us to keep that in the forefront of our minds. I, uh, this is going to stretch us. This is a problem of a scale that we've rarely faced before. It's going to stretch us in all kinds of ways. It's going to stretch our imagination. It's going to stretch us economically. I don't see the uh, uh, either congressional funds or the general fund of the state of Oregon uh, matching the need uh, that this is going to take. That we're going to have to be thinking about this in new ways. And we're really, we're really going to be called on to think in more flexibly than we did in the 80s and 90s about timber. Uh, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of wisdom tonight about that, about looking at forestry in a, in a, in a both and way rather than either or way, which is what hurt us as much as it did in the 80s and 90s, and which caused a pendulum to swing. There are many of us who call ourselves environmentalists who felt that the, the cut on the public forest was way too high in the 80s. And the result, because of rigid thinking, caused a pendulum swing to where we didn't, we didn't use the resource the way we should in the early aughts and other years. And that is a contributor. And I really hope we don't get caught up too much in a, is this a climate change or is this a forest management issue? I'm, I'm convinced, convinced that both have to be addressed one is longer term than the other. In the immediate future, right away, we have to do massive production of fuels in our woods. There's a lot of devil in the details here. How much uh, harvest can we do responsibly to help pay for that? And how much are we going to have to subsidize that if our needs, as I suspect they are, for fuel reduction are in excess of the revenues we're going to get from responsible logging? So this is all, there's a lot to figure out ahead, but I guess I, I'm just praying that we don't repeat sort of the enemy making we did in the 80s and 90s about how the folks who really feel differently than I do about forests have bad intent, don't care about the community, don't care about people. Um, that will get us back into a deeper hole. And I, I will certainly, as a senator from this district, do all I can to keep a very open mind to points of view that may not match mine. Because we're in this together, and uh, and uh, we got this is going to be heavy lift for the next number of years, and I I look forward to collaborating with Jackson County government to find solutions. Thanks again for the opportunity, Mr. Hi, I'm I'm Dick Gordon, uh, 1030 Callaway Drive, Medford. Uh, yes, I'm on the Medford City Council, but I'm here as a citizen. Uh, with all the time and knowledge, I was going to pick up on being on the council. I'm one of those that has a personal breathing problem during the summer, and it's been catastrophic the last couple of years for me personally. Yes. Um, it's, been, it's been very difficult for me the last couple of summers. If I didn't use a CPAP at night, I, I don't know what I would have, uh, would have done. But, um, it was, it was my life saver for this summer because I was able to get away for a couple weeks. But I wanted to talk about something a little different. Um, you know, AARP came out recently with a survey in their last bulletin that indicated that 49% of the population 
uh, there will be a 49% increase in the 65 and lower population uh, by 1930 in Oregon. A lot of that's going to occur in Southern Oregon. A lot of that is people getting older, and a lot of it will be new citizens coming in. They're not going to move here if we can't do something about the things. And that leads me into talking about uh, basically the fires that we've had along Bear Creek, uh, the Greenway fires. The smoke from some of those fires were the worst at my house and were the most difficult for me to personally get through. And that's something within the control of the city and the county to do something about. According to the uh, Deputy Fire Marshal Medford Orgonian, or in an article in the Mail Tribune, there was 50 some odd fires, uh, 50 plus fires on the Greenway, and 30 some of them needed suppression. Um, the smoke from those fires made life very difficult. I don't know if we do it through the Joint Powers Agreement or uh, how we do it, but somehow between the cities and the county, we need to figure out a way to stop the fires along the Greenway. That's doing our part, instead of blaming everybody else. Also, wildfires. It's an urban-rural interface. The city staff has been telling me for years that we can only control what's in the city limits. That if it's in the county, there's nothing that they can do. A lot of the fuel that potentially could burn within the city is located in the county. And again, there needs to be more work between the county and the city. A city is plural to help with this urban-rural interface to help protect our cities so our citizens and the cities are safe. Thanks. Uh, my name is Renee Delaney, and I'm a citizen of Ashland, Oregon. Um, I'm actually a native of Oregon, but I have been here for
in order to have that policy and have people understand that you guys are also there for us and you know maybe you're suffering and have family members who are suffering from the same things that we're going through thank you very much for hearing me today will you tell us your nonprofit? yes ma'am it's called the <laughs> land manatee foundation land manatee foundation land manatee foundation Uh, private landowners so that 